Today, we're talking supergroups, and in particular, one of the most unexpected collaborations of the 1980s. This band featured three big-time names coming out of three big-time careers. Uh, starting completely from scratch, they wrote half an album their first weekend together as a band, including today's massive hit. The only thing is two of them were sure their other bandmate was going to hate the demo. Uh, kind of a rogue character. They were really freaked out that he'd tear this song apart. Then a couple of years later, with two successful albums under their belt, their label actually offered them a million dollars not to record a third album. It's crazy. Did they take the money or did they make the album anyway? I'll tell you, this band, uh, their story is pretty damn good. Find out all the details coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you wanted a bike, just like Pee Wee Herman's after watching this big adventure back in 1985, you're going to dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Hit the big red button, click the bell, all that jazz. Uh, I know you'll find something on here that'll make you smile, uh, take you back. Uh, also, check us out on Patreon. Man, that really helps us to do more interviews and to keep this a daily channel. And check out our merch below. All of these things help. So it's time for another edition of one of my favorite shows we do on here, Number One in Our Hearts. This is the show that honors songs that were so great, they absolutely should have been number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. But for whatever reason, it'll be a radio play, lack of marketing, label support, or just uh, stupidity, the song came up a bit short. On today's episode... We're featuring a super group that doesn't get enough love. Uh, it actually came up on my playlist the other day, and I thought, I gotta, gotta cover these guys because their story, the uh, story behind their career, very interesting. Comprised of Styx vocalist slash guitarist Tommy Shaw, Night Ranger vocalist and bassist Jack Blades, and guitarist Ted Nugent, as well as drummer Michael Cartalone. Damn Yankees were one of several supergroups that emerged at the tail end of the 80s. Uh, today we're going to talk about their biggest hit, as well as the story of the band. Like I said, supergroups were a thing in the late 80s. Uh, kicking off that list in 87 was American British rocker Bad English. That lineup featured Journey's Neil Sean and uh, Jonathan Kane and John Waite and Ricky Phillips and Dean Castronova. Uh, you might remember their hits, When I See You Smile and The Price of Love. Then in 1988, a trio of supergroups, Alias, Badlands, and Mr. Big, all hit the airwaves as well, uh, releasing songs like Dreams in the Dark, More Than Words Can Say, and To Be With You. There must have been something in the air at that time. These damn Yankees followed suit uh, soon after that. They formed in 1989 at the end of the 80s. By this point in their career, the would-be band members were in something of a lull. After Styx disbanded in 84, Tommy Shaw embarked on a solo career. By 1987, had released three solo albums. Although he garnered a couple top 40 uh, mainstream rock hits, things weren't moving in the right direction. Uh, Ted Nugent was in the midst of a decade-long slump that hit the bottom with his 1988 LP, If You Can't Lick Em, Lick em. That turned into Paltry number 112 ranking on the U.S. charts. Future Leonard Skinner drummer Michael Cartalone was still working his way up to the ranks at this point. So uh, not much there. But then there was Night Ranger's Jack Blades, who had just called it quits at the end of uh, their 1988 tour. I believe it was Man in Motion. In Jack's view, Night Ranger had played out by that point. It just wasn't fun anymore. All four musicians were looking for new opportunities, new blood, which was something that Geffen a and executive John Kolodner took notice of. The damn Yankees were actually his brainchild. Said Kolodner, I just had this idea. I think I had dinner with Tommy Shaw, and for some reason I got into this mindset. I knew Ted Nugent well, and he wasn't really doing anything. Night Ranger wasn't really doing anything, and Tommy Shaw was kind of in and out of, with sticks at that point. So I came up with this crazy idea to have the three of them have a super group. You know, as Jack Blades remembers it, Kalodner called him five days after Night Ranger played their last show and told him that Ted and Tommy were working on some songs in New York. But it wasn't quite clicking. 
You know, John thought maybe Jack could be the spark that they needed. So Kalodner flew Jack out to New York, and before he knew it, he was standing on Tommy Shaw's porch on the Upper West Side. The first weekend together, the newly assembled band members ended up writing half of the damn Yankees debut album. In particular, Jack and Tommy they hit it off right away. It was an instant rapport, said Blades about it. When Tommy and I first got together, writing was probably one of the easiest things that we did. Lyric-wise, we approached the area the same. We felt very comfortable, and Shaw agreed. He said, I think it comes from having a relaxed relationship with each other, and I guess the confidence to let somebody else write the whole thing, if need be, or you write the whole thing. We split everything 50-50. Jack Howard admitted that things were a little bit different with Ted Nugent, but that's really no surprise. Ted is, after all, Ted. But in his defense, Nugent said, you know, everybody goes, I can't believe Ted Nugent could be in a band. He's such a domineering prick. Being a domineering prick is a lot of fun, but it's not a full-time job. I improvise and adapt and overcome. I'm only a domineering prick when I have to be. End of quote. That was Ted. So there you go. And actually, it was Ted Nugent who uh, came up with the band name. In an off-the-cuff moment, he said, well, we're a bunch of damn Yankees. Let's call the band that. Getting a band together and figuring out a name was one thing, but they still needed to convince Geffen that they could write hits. You know, even with John Kalodner backing them with his uh, respected name, uh, wasn't enough. So John challenged them to write two commercial hits that he could pitch the label. So challenge accepted. One of those two would-be hits would become the band's signature song. One we're going to cover today, High Enough. Can you take me high enough? It's actually a pretty good story behind this one. This is what Jack Blade said about writing it. He said, I was downstairs at Tommy Shaw's flat in New York City. We were all sitting around. I'm doing laundry down in the basement because I had just gotten to his place and I'm just singing. I don't want to hear about it anymore. It's a shame. I've got to live without you anymore. I don't want to hear about it anymore. Tommy just happened to overhear him, and he said, Wow, what is that? And Jack said, You know, I don't know. It's just something I'm singing around with. So Tommy says, Well, it sounds really great. I find whenever I labor over trying to write a song or something like that, it's never one of the best ones, like High Enough, the damn Yankees song. Um, was Tommy and I wrote that thing at 30 minutes later, the entire song was written. It was, you know, the good songs come real quick. You know, that yeah. song was written so fast you know i wrote that thing just boom it just came out you know what i mean it just all you know all the good songs are, are like that but then they got this uh, sinking feeling at that moment they were like uh oh we got to play this thing for ted nugent he's gonna hate it he's gonna think we're a couple of pansies as we find out what happens next when they show that to ted i want to mention our sponsor zenny i wear the glasses i always wear Right now at Zenni, with the holidays coming, uh, you can get multiple pairs of glasses in all different styles for the best prices out there. Beat inflation with Zenni. Click on our info button right up here to get the best price. Can you take me high? So back to damn Yankees. Jack Blades would describe Ted Nugent, the rogue guitarist, as a gonzo hell-bent for leather kind of guy. A Motor City Madman, as he's called. Here they were getting ready to pitch him a power ballad. So as it was, uh, Jack and Tommy were 100% sure that Ted would dismiss this song. Finally, they were like, the hell with it. Let's just go play it for him. So brace him for the worst. They played the cassette for Ted Nugent. And it was like time stood still is what they said. He just sat there listening and listening. Had his feet up on the table. He was chewing on a toothpick. He just kept going, hmm, sort of nodding his head. Jack and Tommy, they were sweating bullets. And Jack was thinking, oh man, he hates it. He's going to get a, a gun out and shoot us right on the spot. Boom, it's going to be the end of damn Yankees. Tommy Shaw and Jack Blades killed by Ted Nugent. That's what they said. <laughs> but when the song was finished, Ted just sat back in his chair, shook his head, and he said, you know what that song needs? Jack and Tommy were like, okay, here it comes. What does it need, Ted? What does it need? It needs this. And Ted grabbed his guitar and started jamming and throwing down these Detroit-style licks. And Tommy and Jack breathed a huge sigh of relief. They said, that's exactly what it needs. So crisis averted for the time. Ted actually was all in on the song. They were pleasantly surprised to learn that their bandmate 
actually had a softer side that neither of them knew about. The song's meaning, according to Blades, is about falling in love with someone so much but not wanting to scare them away. I don't want to live without you anymore. Said Jack, you know how you get scared at first when you fall in love and everybody freaks out and that can't be right. And then you go, wait a minute, this is great. Let's forget about the past. Can you fly me over yesterday? Can you take me high enough to fly me over yesterday? So surprisingly, Ted's assessment it goes a little deeper. He said that the song is about the reciprocity of human relationships. High enough is Jack, Tommy, Michael, and my statement that we care about you. Can we reach a higher level of awareness together? It's not about getting high, it's about a higher level of awareness and respect for each other. Can you take then you watch the music video like I did, and I'm confused. I thought it was about uh, prison. We'll talk about that in a second. So, you know, awareness, respect, prison, love story drama, however you want to describe it. The guys knew that they had a surefire hit on their hands. Kolodner knew it too. In fact, with High Enough and another future single coming of age, Kolodner was very confident that Geffen would sign the damn Yankees on the spot. However, when they played the tracks for the label, the promotion team shot them down. They said, we'll never get these songs on the radio. Memory, just a memory, and, and when they approached Geffen president Ed Rosenblatt, he told him he didn't want to sign another so-called corporate rock band. Uh, Kolodner and the band they were stunned. High enough, they knew it was a surefire hit. They were very confused. So Blades took their songs to a rival label, Warner Brothers. Jack played the exact same demos for Michael Austin, head of A&R uh, for Warner Brothers. Blades remembers that he played the first song, Coming of Age. And then he played High Enough. By the time they got to the chorus, Austin stopped the tape and he said, who's your lawyer? Have him call me in the morning, it's a done deal. So High Enough was released as the second single from the Damn Yankees debut after Coming of Age. It reached number three on the Billboard Hot 100 in September of 1990. And it did one better on the US album Rock Tracks chart and went to number two. Now in terms of sales, the single did really well, it sold over 500,000 plus copies in the US alone. High Enough, it also did very well around the world. Went to number 24 in New Zealand. It went to number 12 in Canada. But for some reason, um, it's all at number 81 in the UK. Maybe it had something to do with the band name. Can you find me over, tell me over okay, so I told you we get to the music video. That was uh, filmed at River Rodge, Louisiana. And it depicts a modern Bonnie and Clyde couple who commit a series of small time robberies. I didn't know what to say when you called me. Her last score appears to go south as the video implies the boyfriend has committed homicide. This provokes a manhunt by the police. He gets away, but the girlfriend is given the death penalty. Can you take me high Meanwhile, the police surround the guy in his home and open fire. The band, of course, is there playing through the whole standoff in the hellfire of bullets. As police storm the house, the story cuts back to the girlfriend walking on death row. Behind her, the priest is revealed to be none other than Ted Nugent. <laughs> and the new millennium, High Enough, has been streamed over 100 million times on Spotify and YouTube, which puts it ahead of Nugent's Cat Scratch Fever. Just about on par with Styx's Babe and Night Ranger's sister Christian, amazingly. You know it's you, babe. High Enough has been covered pretty much by all the guys in their former capacities as part of Styx and Night Ranger. Ted Nugent has performed as a solo artist as well. 
Uh, but really outside of the Damn Yankees universe, I don't know of any big name artists have covered it. I couldn't find any in my research. Such a shame. Can you take me high enough? Overall, Damn Yankees debut record did very well. It reached number 13 on the Billboard 200, certified double platinum in the US when things were really changing in radio. In addition to High Enough, four other singles were released from the album. All of them did well in the mainstream rock charts. Coming of Age actually went to number one, Come Again went to number five, Runaway number nine, and Bad Reputation went to number 31. She can't help it. She's coming of age. Now, here I come again. Oh, yeah. Run, run, run away. Got a bad, bad reputation. But none of them came close to the Hot 100 success of High Enough, the crossover. In 92, Damn Yankees released a follow-up album, Don't Tread. That one produced the number 20 hot power ballad hit, Where You Going Now? Where you going now? Three more mainstream rock hits followed after that, Don't Tread On Me, that reached number three. Silence Is Broken went to number 20, and Mr. Please went to number three. So this band was on a roll. I mean, maybe not on the Hot 100, but they were a powerhouse on the rock charts. In all, they released nine singles over a three-year span, and seven of them went top 10 on the mainstream rock survey. Damn Yankees' second record, Don't Tread, that climbed to number 22 in August of 92, and it certified gold in the U.S., not bad for their first two albums. But sadly, it would be their last album together as a band. As Jack Blades tells it, 90s alternative rock and the advent of the grunge movement turned the industry upside down. You were there, you remember. He said, the new regime came in and they didn't want to do anything. And in fact, they paid Damn Yankees a million dollars not to do another Damn Yankees record. We're like, really? Okay, we'll just take the check. Jack would go on to say that because Damn Yankees had sold so many records, their contract allotted a million bucks to write and record their third album. But their label didn't want anything to do with their style of music anymore, with what was going on. So they just paid them off to go away, which is the equivalent of over $2 million in today's money. $2 million, it's crazy. But you know, Jack Blades wasn't bitter. I mean, how could he be? He just got a whole lot richer. But he also saw the music shift as a good thing. In his view, there needed to be a scene change. It was time. Uh, saw all these derivative bands and producers that were coming up in the industry. You know, things were getting stagnant and music just needed a reset. Jack called the 90s a good creative period for himself and for Tommy. And you know, they stayed extremely busy. They wrote songs for acts like Alice Cooper and Aerosmith and Ozzy Osbourne, Cher, Vince Neil, and Journey. It was uh, really a fun time for them, actually. And then in 1995, Blades and Shaw teamed up for a duo record called Hallucination. Uh, the album also included Michael Cardalone playing drums on three of the tracks. So technically, it was three-fourths of Damn Yankees on this record. Maybe you could call it Damn Yankees 2.5. <laughs> Two songs on the album, My Hallucination and I'll Always Be With You, received a little airplay. But Warner had pulled the plug on their genre and without any label support, uh, just basically stalled. Afterwards, Blades and Shaw both reunited with their former bands, Night Ranger and Styx, uh, who they're with right now. I'll always be with you. Ted Nugent, for his part, revived his solo career and released Spirit of the Wild in 1995, but that didn't fare much better. Through the rest of the decade, Damn Yankees would occasionally reunite periodically you know, in the studio and attempt to record a third album. In 1999, they even uh, went as far as naming it Bravo. Uh, but alas, the LP was never completed. Since then, multiple mini reunions have taken place uh, in the new millennium, including Alice Cooper's annual charity concert, a Christmas Pudding, in 2004. Uh, there, the Yankees reunited on stage and played Don't Tread, Coming of Age, and High Enough all together. Yeah. 
But as for that lost third album, uh, Blades has confirmed that it's just never going to happen. He said it will always be that long lost record. Little pieces of that have dripped out on my solo record. Tommy had a song on Styx's Cyclorama record. Ted's done two or three of them. That record will never see the light of day, but the ones that came out are the best of it. Even so, we're grateful that at least we got two complete Damn Yankees albums. So let's, uh, let's talk about the number one status, number one in our hearts. High Enough peaked at number three on January 12, 1991. Uh, just ahead of it at number two is Stevie B with Because I Love You, the Postman song. Because I love you. And uh, at number one was Madonna with Justify My Love. For you to justify my love. And you know what? I think this one's kind of obvious. Damn Yankees deserves the number one for that one week. Let them sort it out later. Let's just do it. No questions asked. High enough. The coveted number one spot, after all, it's a pretty damn fine song from a pretty damn fine band. Whoa, 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 whoa. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Damn Yankees and High Enough. What are your memories of this song, of this super group, of the other, their other output of the other super groups? What else should we cover on here of the super groups from the 70s and 80s? Uh, the lesser known ones, let us know below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. We would love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.